your dad. I still can't write a bloody sentence. You don't need college and fancy degrees to get on in life. You just need a bit of common sense. Well, like when you're in a fight, you don't do all that messing about, pushing and getting in folks' faces like them shit houses up street. You hit them hard and fast like lightning. Destroy them before they know they're in bother simple common sense. You go to college if you want to work for a living, but works for fools and horses. You just need a bit of bloody gumption, that's all I had. Because when I started off, I hadn't a been. I borrowed 50 quid off your mum and bought a second-hand car. That's how I started off, buying and selling old bangers. I never needed to write, spell or bugger all. But we're different in that way, Dad. I think differently. Analyse everything to the nth degree. Maybe from playing chess as a boy. All brains are no common sense, as you'd say. And I'm not a talker, so that's maybe why I write. I don't know. But nowadays I can feel myself becoming a writer. In the sense that I see someone now, just a normal fella buying a pint, or a body getting off a train. And I think about character, how they talk and carry themselves. What motivates them and describing stuff and all. The way a dress complements the curve of a woman's back. Or if I see a dead magical sky, I think about the quality of the light, the way it breathes life into the scene. And if I wanted to write something like in a book, not like we're talking now, but what you might call proper writing, I'd maybe use a more formal voice or register to give us access to more words or allow for more accuracy than the way I speak. For example, if I wanted to share a sunlit sky, I might capture the way sunbeams weld the cloud and fall diagonally past its edge, the slope of the beams grading along the horizon, and the thinner cloud below, thin as mist and sepia infused, almost neon peach where it's holding the light, and the billow of clouds sitting back, set like a portrait, a jewel in the crown, molten light pooling on the surface and the heavenly glow in the haze of its warmth. But they reckon the best writing's when it doesn't even sound like writing, when it tells a story without distracting the reader, a bit like us here now just having a pint and a crack, on about fighting and common sense and what writing means to us. Now then, Julie, it's better if you spread the butter from edge to edge on the bread. If it's not soft enough to get it smooth, put it on the radiator to heat through. Your great-grandmother, your granddad's mother, taught me that. We used to put it on the range up at Swallowhead Farm. If you got it to the right temperature, it would spread easier. So a pat of butter could go a good way further. Your great-grandmother was very strict with me. She limited how much bread people could have and how much butter we used. <laughs> I suppose she had to be careful. There were lots of visitors. People came from all over to have high tea at Swallowhead Farm. That station down the road was packed until Dr Beach enacted it. You could hear the trains come in, see the steam from the bottom field, 
and people walked up the hill and they went into the big wood panelled room. Every afternoon, your great grandmother would go and get a day dress on and greet them. The rest of us did the work. We did whatever she told us to do. Twelve adults and she was in charge. Of course she gave the worst job to me. The snotty, mucky, stained washing. She gave her own daughter the best one. Looking after the bairns. My bairns. I had to stand at the copper in the outhouse with sopping sheets. Tripping detergent all over my fingers. Well, she stayed with my babies. Sometimes I could hear them crying. That's why we left. Get the butter off the radiator, Julie, else it will be too runny. We went when your dad was nine months old. We got a horse and cart and all our belongings and took them up over the hill across the fields to Ramsdale. It was damp in winter and midge-ridden in summer, but it was all ours. I loved it there. Just me and your granddad and our bears. But then your granddad came to tell me that your great-grandmother had to leave the farm and she had nowhere to go. I loved your granddad. I told him we'd take her in. Cut the slices into triangles next. Four quarters is best. That's grand, Julie. Keep buttering that bread, then we'll have plenty. I like people to have as much as they want. No matter how many people turn up, nobody ever leaves my table wanting. on New Year's Eve too and deaf in Sandy she's hideous shagging that supposed to be my best friend too the rules for friendship are all there in the books doll you've just forgotten them there's no point arguing you're single again love and at your age Just after Christmas and all, I suppose the goose was at its fattest. Well, I hope you enjoy your pound of flesh, you bastard. Some men will always take advantage. But read my book, Lace. That's about three friends. Mind you, none of them look like you. You. You are going to make all the difference. Wipe the slate clean. You are, soul. Is he a prince? Or does his family own a vineyard doll? No? Okay. Mm. So the first rule is be beautiful. Just be gorgeous, doll. He shouldn't be able to take his eyes off you. I think that arse might have bolted. At least he was only a mechanic. You said next year would be our year. I started to look forward at what I could be. Stopped being dragged backward, back to what I was. And Sandy, I loved her like a sister. The cow. Oh, you can't trust friends, Don. At best, their competition of an engine for the plot. And how many friends do you need, love? You don't need a cast of thousands. <laughs> One would do. I'd like to tell someone about the baby. They don't feel it like us when they lose one. 
They just have another. He, or she, was going to be a new start. New year, new baby. A little bundle of forgiveness. You're paying the penalty for your sins. And I'm never like that, Sandy. You should marry for money, doll. Mind you, you'll earn every penny. But it's better than Woolworths. Ha! You don't understand. I was doing well with a mechanic. Forget your troubles, come on, get happy. Judy in black tights and a DJ, tipping the brim of a fedora. I'm gonna chase all your cares away. The Saturday matinee, 2 p.m., BBC Two. Orphaned by the two till 10 shift at the factory and the Saturday afternoon rush at the cafe. I've been adopted by Hollywood and it's soft focus American dream. Let's put on a show. But Judy and Jean's happy ending is interrupted by the key in the door and mother with a bag of cafe leftovers. Judy Garland, she had a tragic life, you know. She'd been fed on drugs since she was a kid. Uppers, downers, just to keep her going. She looked about 90 in her 40s and her management stole all her money. And she had to drag her kids from hotel to hotel, then duck out without paying. Like not being able to pay your rent, I suppose. Like the Jacksons next door who were evicted. Do you want sauce with your chips? Sauce and salt? Put the news on. Derry and Enna Skillin and IRA and UDR and Bloody Sunday. I'm just a girl who can't say no. Gloria in a bonnet and prairie skirt as Ado Annie, shaking her head and furrowing her brow at her own poor judgment. I'm in a terrible fix. Key in the door. Mother, a plastic bag of stolen toilet rolls in her hand. Gloria Graham, I hear. She lived in Liverpool for a while, you know, when she was dying. I know what you think. Film stars don't die in Liverpool. But she had a friend here, a young man, much younger. Your Auntie Lil knows his mother. She heard all about it. She was riddled with cancer, Gloria Graham was. They say she put makeup on and wore wigs, but she was haggard by it all towards the end. A sorry sight, just like my mum was when she died. Do you want sauce with your chips? Sauce and salt? Put the news on. Cold War, nuclear winter, duck and cover, Soviet spy. Hooray for Hollywood, that screwy ballyhooey Hollywood. Key in the lock. Mum's shift is over. It's cold inside and out. The gas meter's empty. She keeps her coat on. Hip hip bloody hooray. Someone threw themselves off the Hollywood sign, you know. Clean off. Entwistle her name. It killed her. She couldn't take it anymore. Too hard. Too damn hard like Mrs Munro down the road. God bless her. Do you want sauce with that? Sauce and salt? Put the news on. Thatcher, loads of money. Running battles at Orgreave. Bloodied faces and swinging batons. There is no such thing as society. We had no shoes, you know, back on the camp. At least none of us kids did. Then some relative, he comes back from his foreign bank up and give you all daddies. I couldn't take my eyes off him. His shoes. Of course, your old man needed them more than the rest of us, him being the oldest. Fell on him to feed all six families in the yurt. Six mums and a yurt of young uns, no men. Your dad had Percy's old aunt back Stevens. 
that bugger had been his trench gun, saved his life many a time. He couldn't shoot it no more, seen too many cut down with it. And most come back and they weren't never right after all the killing they'd seen. Percy, all his nightmares weren't about that, they were about bloody dysentery. You know, the shits. They all had it, all the bloody while they were over there. He'd run out and like water. They'd have to go 10, 20 times a day. All they had to do was dig an hole inside the trench, stand there while they'd shit, and wipe their ass with their hands afterwards. That was daily life for the poor buggers. Never let the poor stop. 50 million souls got in that war from bombs and bullets, but most half that again died disease in them bloody trenches. <coughs> but them shoes, before I stop and see them now. First was a mate of your granddad, Frank. Now he were a dapper bugger. All them were. He didn't talk about the war either, but we all knew he was a rear gunner in a lank, and not many of them come back. See, German fighters had 30 mil cannon. Well, that makes you anywhere, you're buggered. Be shooting at them Lancasters from 500 yards over yonder, punching holes as big as cricket balls through men and planes. Free how freeze your granddad had. Well, they'd be like bloody pea shooters up against them. Range no better than 100 yards before they dropped. Most rear gunners, they weren't enough to bury what come back. All bloody ground crew had to hose out what was left. Your dad give me them shoes, you know. We had to pack them out with newspaper to make them fit. He knew. I couldn't take my eyes off him. He bloody knew. Of course he pretended he didn't want them. He was a good bloke, your dad. Best friend I ever had. I saw a rag rug not so long ago, selling for 300 pounds. Artisan, the description said. Crafts and old ways up for sale by people who read books on how to do them. I could see the smiles on my grandmother's faces, hear the cackled thigh slap of fools and money so fast parted. The pluck and pull of that fierce hook, the rip of fabric wrenched through tiny square. My grandmothers are making something from nothing and I am captive at their feet. A pluck, a pull, a rip. I tell Lincolnshire Granny I am hungry. You don't know what it is, my duck. Evil man, my father, wicked. I ate orange peel up a street once when I was six. I can still taste that pith. I tell Suffolk Nana I am cold. Get away, you soft girl. You can see the sky through my thatch and I ain't had a day in hospital even after 10 kiddies. Well, that's central heating. That's what give you cancer. No one talks about the rural poor. Say farm and see mines fill with suckled cream and pulling lamb legs from a womb. But we were not of farming stock. The land we worked on never ours, the calloused hands for hire, the women with backs bent. No hobby farmers here. A pluck, a pull, a rip. I tell Nana I am hungry. Soft. Your dad'll tell you we ate blackbird more than once. At least I weren't messed about with. That's the chemicals in the food what's made your feet so big. Look at them. Does he grow rabs? I tell Granny, I am cold. I were dressed for July and January when I found him hanging. Thin as the leather strips he beat us with. Bernardo's weren't much better, my duck. Service, neither. Now then, give that coal a poke. Entertainment that must be made is fertile ground for music, fun, and story. Nana's creaky old cock robin, Granny's Sally, pride of our alley in pitch perfect tone. Till I tell both I pulled the petals off a daisy and he loves me. A pluck, a rip, a pull. You can't trust a man, plast. I was a thorpe and happy as all the birds in the wood. Then I was a Briggs, poor as a church mouse. Does he grow up fool? Don't you set your store by no man, gal. Don't you rush into getting wed, my duck. 
I'd never have had all them kids if I'd had a choice. I'd have liked a little bakery. Don't you be daft enough to rely on no man. Pluck, rip, pull. I grow and get the pill and a degree, and I get out. But still their voices ring loud. What I was, what I won't be, what I am. I wonder who will buy this rag rug, this craft once only known from lack of and from need. If they'll put it on a carpet to rest warm feet for talk of sustainability and green. I celebrate the old ways, yes, I do. But they are not the country life I knew. Welcome to Moorfield. Our exciting new development of executive homes that you knock down the old dog track to make way for. It's situated close to the East Durham Heritage Coastline, a bit richer you to talk heritage, and the local area is ideal for picturesque walks. Before the miners started the shifts, you'd take the grounds down the back beach and walk them on the sand. But when the Prophet Mech and Colliery got shut down, they trained the dogs till the paws went hard and black, like the coal they couldn't mine them all. The nearby towns of Peter Lee and Seaham offer additional entertainment opportunities. Bit richer you to talk entertainment. There are excellent road links for commuters. People come here from all over the place. Middlesbrough, Mexborough, Musselburgh, Bamborough. And the development features generously proportioned detached family houses flocked like almond pigeons from all across the country, with French doors leading onto gardens to click and clack our way past Cheryl on the turnstile, perfect for family gatherings. Blokes decked out in the five gold sovereign rings of Christmas. Women with slick back hair made silver be lacquer. Brick built lads and rock hard lasses in Oxo red and Yorkie bar blue track suits. Model thin greyhounds with weightlifters chests and footballers legs and courts like their medals the athletes get. Gold fawn, silver blue, bronze brindle. There's a choice of schooling for all ages. Bit richer you to talk education, with primaries, secondaries, and a sixth form college nearby. From the eldest of timers sitting in his favorite chair, to the orange pit bairns kipping in mammy's belly. And bedroom five can even be used as a study. We were students, the law of us and the fine art a land and a gamble. Prices start from as little as 214950. Bit richer you to talk money, or from just £691 per month. When the dog that was trying wouldn't be half the track, the lads and lasses had line up, palms up, to get the blisters and the chillblains covered up with blood moon red 50 quid notes. Moorfield is the perfect place for your new family home. How dare you talk about homes? 